Okay, so today is May 11th, 2020. This is Dale Jarvis, the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer with Heritage NL. And today I'm having a chat with Vicki, Vicki Walsh. Uh, Vicki, do you want to introduce yourself and, and tell us where we're, where we're chatting from? Uh, well, we are, uh, my name is Vicki Walsh and I'm a textile artist and uh, we are <laughs> live from my home <laughs> in Burnt Cove. Uh, which is just south of Toroscope, about five minutes, because most okay. people know Toroscope, not Burncoat, uh, on the southern shore, and uh, from my house up in the woods. <laughs> and who is in your bubble? Oh, I'm lucky. I have two sons uh, and my husband. We're all in our own bubble. Yeah. And we haven't dub doubled the bubble yet, because we have everybody i'm really <laughs> lucky uh, i have a sister in town but she's in a very serious bubble uh of uh, her and her son so she's got the autoimmune post-cancer thing so for us to jump into her bubble it's a little hard right yeah yeah so, but you know uh, our our double bubbles are people we help and uh so we have a few helpers with the masks actually that help me produce or acquire some materials so i didn't have to leave here and go somewhere else very often right i mean you know once a week or once every two weeks at the beginning so i had like um a friend of mine leah singh i don't know if you know her mm. she worked at the craft council oh, okay, gallery yes, yeah and uh, she was in her bubble, and I asked her to help me make some of the metal nose pieces that go in the mask, because it was getting very hard to do all of it from scratch, because you couldn't buy any of these things. So she, when she would um, go out to do her groceries, she'd pick up the supplies she needed to make them the metal nose pieces, and her and her bubble made some, I think, 150 of them for me. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful. And another lady, um, Muggs Thibault, uh, she's Margaret Thibault. She has taken over Leah's spot because Leah had to go to the Coast Guard training thing last week. Um, so Muggs Thibault is helping me make more nose pieces. And uh, she's also um, sort of helping me spread the masks out into the community where people need them. Like Rainbow mm -hmm. Riders are getting some really nice horsey ones. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, horseshoes and gear for riders that you probably can't really know or see, but the people who get them will. Yeah. So that was one of the things that she's doing. Um, so she picked them up yesterday and she'll give them to some of the staff at Ram Rainbow Riders. So, let's, uh, so there's things like that that we're doing, right? So let's maybe make, maybe go back to the beginning of all of this, yep. just to yep. just to give some context. W when did you start to become aware that this was more than just a, a seasonal flu? Like, when did you start to become aware that this was something out of the ordinary? Uh, I think the very first thing was, of course, the news coming out of uh, China on the national news. We watched the CBC national news, and then you hear of it. And I remember, I felt that right at the beginning, I felt this was something big, because we've all heard of other things that can actually spread quite quickly if they're not contained. And I, to be quite honest, when I saw that China was building <laughs> the amazing hospital in 10 mm -hmm. days, for yeah. whatever, I said, gee, you know, this is, this is different. This is, to me, in my head, I thought, that's amazing, first of all, that they're putting that out there to the world to see right so i thought well we should be prepared for something and then i think it was shortly thereafter I, on facebook um there was a little news clip from a, a really young girl um this is when it started to hit italy and central europe mm. um there was a young girl who put out a video and it was called masks for all and that that was it it was a, it's a hashtag I don't use but anyway uh, she put out a video about how the Czech Republic had had done their part by saying everybody who left the house had to wear a mask and so what they were doing is trying to encourage people to make masks for all and to make it available to as many people as possible 
So then I thought, I said, well, this girl, she did a very nice job of explaining how the Czech Republic had contained it more than some of the other countries surrounding Central Europe. And I thought, well, if that's happening over there, I think we're going to end up there. I don't know when, but maybe the summer. But I thought, well, I'm sitting here. <laughs> you can't go anywhere by then. It was <laughs> March 6th. And I think March 6th is when um, Mount Pearl uh, shut down a lot of the recreation facilities. But I think that's the correct date. And my son works uh, as a gymnastics coach. And so he was laid off because mm. of the COVID. Everything had shut down. And then I went back to that video and I, I, I then decided uh, I would just share the video. <laughs> I thought masks are going to be important. And uh, after that, I said, I think I'll just start making them. Why not? Right. And then I started doing some tutorials uh, on Facebook cause, or on YouTube because you can find everything about that. And by then, the, in, in mid-March, um, a lot more people were starting to jump on the make your own masks. And I think that is to save the medical level masks or PPE for the professionals who really need it. So people like myself who are only just going to the grocery store, we wouldn't need one of the N95s. So, you know, the best thing is to have something the next level down that you can make yourself out of materials you can find around. So uh, that's my job as a sewing. And so I thought, well, if I can do something to help other people who don't sew. And I, I know you know a lot of people yeah. in the music world too. Uh, I have friends who are singers and musicians and they're always uh, treating us to a lot of their, uh, I don't know, their, their skills as musicians, kitchen parties and uh, things for free all the time. So I thought, well, if I can make them masks because at first I thought of my friends who were musicians, um, like Leah, and I could make something for her and her family. So that's when it just started to spread from my immediate crowd to then my friends who are musicians who don't sew. And they'll be the first to say, they play music, they're not into sewing. And a lot of it has to do with the fingers, right? <laughs> you don't want a sewing machine to come down on your very uh, important digits. So, um, that's how it sort of started. And then I decided, well, if I'm gonna make 10, I may as well make, I mean, it just batches are better and easier to do than one at a time. So, and that comes from the production side of sewing. So then I decided to start just making them. And I have tons of fabric, of course, mm -hmm. as any quilter or any textile person knows. And I just wanted to say, I could use it all up. I could, I could make masks till I, turn 100 and I still won't go through the stash of fabric that I have. So, uh, but then there were other things like the metal nose pieces had to be made by hand, the ties had to be made by hand, um, the lining, I wanted to put a filter lining inside. So that had to be acquired as another fabric I didn't have. I had some amount of stabilizer, but not a lot. So uh, through Leah and mugs, uh, we managed to collect as much as that sort of things that, that we needed. And so I've made, I think it's not a lot, but it's about 350 so far that are finished and out the door. And then there's about another couple of hundred in progress, right? From the fabric has to be washed and then it has to be dried and ironed and oh, then it's traced and cut and so on. <laughs> so there's a lot of steps when you're making small items like a mask, even though it, it seems like a really simple little thing to do. There, for all the sewers out there that are doing them, there's people that uh, together with a large group of women like myself all over the world are making hundreds of thousands of them. And it's nice, every hundred counts or every one counts when you're sharing them with people that have to go out in public, right? And it's mostly people going shopping for groceries that are really using them. Uh, my friends don't use them walking around. <laughs> Uh, they use them to go to the big shopping centers to get their groceries. Um, and that's where they need, they need to have them, right? So, you know, we've offered them free because I am not, uh, I'm sort of retired from the world of making money. <laughs> so I didn't think that I needed to sell them, but I, I, 
I am so grateful because I've gotten a rooster and two chickens for payment uh, out of thanks for a bubble worth. And then uh, another bubble came up with, well, if she's got three chickens, we may as well give her two more. So I've got a small flock of hens. <laughs> and uh, I just got a little garden gnome from another bubble friend who said thank you. And um, it wasn't requested, it's just they happen to want to give back from, if you give them something, they still want to give you something, right? So the cash doesn't come in the door, but the the moose does. <laughs> And I, what else did I get? I think I got a couple of boxes of chocolates. <laughs> but I mean, it's really nice that people appreciate the hard work that goes into them. And uh, my friend Muggs, I really appreciate every little bit of help she's given me because it would have taken me, you know, that extra few hours to make the nose pieces that she made, right? And it just, it just takes the, I don't watch as much TV when she helps. <laughs> It means another two hours of watching Netflix while I do the boring tasks of making things, right? Can you so, tell me? Can you tell me a little bit about the the pattern itself? Because I know there's yeah. a couple of different styles of masks out there. Can you can you talk about the pattern yeah. that you're using? Well, this one is is called the Olson mask, and the Olson mask is a, a cup, and uh, it actually t is a shape that uh, because of the stiffener inside it holds its shape and it also has the metal nose piece so when you bend it uh it will fit around your nose so you you shape it to your nose and you pinch it and so it'll be tight so this is really good if people are wearing uh glasses for example a lot of people my husband has glasses a lot of my friends have glasses and they say a lot of the masks create fog so when they put them on, their glasses fog up. But this little peak here, you put it up there and your, your glasses comes right on top of it. So can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. And then it ties behind your ears, just like all the other masks. And it comes down a little bit just on the chin. So this mask was designed for, to have a filter layer inside. So it's not one that you can, there's no pocket. You can't handle it to take it out. You just hand wash it and then hang it to dry. And the idea behind that is if you have a filter opening pocket, you're fiddling with it, you're contaminating even the inside. And the thought was, uh, if you're taking out the filter, people might not wash this. So they'll take out and dispose of the filter and then they'll think they're fine and then they probably won't wash it or something. So anyway, the idea was to have something all built in to make it easier for people to just take it off, put it in the wash when they get home. And uh, so that's the pattern that it was based on. And I put strings on them, uh, which are, I'm a rug hooker. <laughs> and uh, the t-shirt strings are made from the rug hooking uh, strings that I make for t-shirts. And I found that the elastic is too hard on the back of the ear. And if you make the elastic as a loop in the mask, what happens is everybody's head is different. So you'd have to take measurements from the nose to the back of the ear and make the loop fit that person's ear, right? Otherwise, they're loose <laughs> or they're too tight. So this way you can, you can uh, and this was part of the Olsen mask too. If you don't like the way the nurses wear them up over your head, like wrapped, you can just loop them and knot them. I don't know if that's, and then you make a, a knot and then this becomes a loop behind your ear. Now, see, it's too short for me, but if I made it longer, because I have the space to make it longer, then it can fit my ear like just by loosening it. And then you make them both to fit your ear and you can put them on and put them off really fast. So you have the option of two different ways of wearing it. So now I've made it a little longer and now it fits fine, right? And so when I pull it across, I'll just do that. And I'll, you could even tie them, the simple tie. So whoever Olsen was. <laughs> and then you can also tie them like that. So now you've got a really snug mask. You pull it up, put your glasses over them if you need to. and away you go. I, I have it sort of strange on my nose because 
Ah, uh, there we go. So there it is. And then you can tighten it up or loosen it depending. Now, a lot of these masks, you know, we're not used to wearing masks. I, I don't think I've ever worn a mask other from sanding furniture. You know, maybe 20 years ago when I was, you know, doing something with antiques for home. So we're not really used to wearing them, but uh, if you have something that's breathable, and that's the nice thing about these, you can breathe through them, but the filter layer is, is supposed to catch any droplets between the cotton, because cotton isn't gonna do anything. The cotton is just pretty, it's just fashion. Uh, the inside is just to let you know what's the inside, what's the outside, and really the filter layer inside catches somewhat of the droplets. It's not gonna be like the N95 masks either, right? Cause they're special, um, but it'll help a lot, right? Anyway, um, the, the Olsen, there's a lot of different masks out there like the pleated ones. Uh, if I was going to make these for the healthcare offices like doctor's offices, that when you come into the office and you want to have a mask on the patients just for five minutes while they, you know, talk to them or whatever. That's a pleated one and it's just the simplest mask you can make. You know, you just big square, you you pleat it, you put ties on, there's no filter layer, it's just a piece of cotton. And basically they're just meant for that one visit. And they're not totally disposable. The, the, the doctors or the healthcare centers give them to their patients to take home with them and they could wear them as well. But these are kind of uh, just that little extra step, right? Of putting the filter layer inside and with the nose piece. So I decided I would make them because I can. Not everybody can do the more difficult masks. Right, yeah. And, and where I'm a, a, a experienced sewing person, I can certainly make these easily. Uh, whereas someone who's just learning to sew is better to make the pleated ones and they can make thousands of them where I can probably make, uh, you know, 200 at the same time. So there's, that's the difference with the pleated ones. You can do a lot of them, but they're more short term type masks. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to go with this pattern. And did you find the pattern online? online. Yeah. yeah. Uh, masks for all uh, was one of the sources for that particular mask uh, only because that was the one it seemed that she was wearing um, so then when I went on I went to YouTube and the University of Florida uh, was putting out free patterns for the Olsen mask um, it was basically one or two sizes uh, it's not that hard to make I mean for someone like me I can take this and make it up or down in size which I did but <clears throat> they offer, I think, on the one shape, two different sizes. So what I did is I went down three sizes for children, and I went up to an extra large for, I have a friend <laughs> who, uh, big guy, big red beard, plays fabulous music. And I thought of him, and I said, no, I think he'd need an extra large to <laughs> encompass that big beard. Fit that beard in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Payne, wherever you are. <laughs> So I thought of his size and I went and I made an extra men's large, right? And, uh, and so those are the patterns I have templated so that I can, if I get as far as the sending them out to Cornerbrook, uh, he'll be getting the, some for his family. Uh, and I have friends with kids and uh, they're little grandchildren, actually, not kids. And uh, they wanted, you know, if they were taking their kids out for walks in the park or at the, the, some grandparents had to take kids with them shopping it's not they wanted to they would have preferred to leave them home i'm sure but a lot of people have no choice but to take children with them so that's when uh the masks were, were requested for the young ones and uh, they have no trouble wearing the masks at all i thought they'd be hauling them off and refusing but i made them look cute so little soccer balls or basketballs or anything Kid like went into the kids' masks and uh, they wear them just like they're having a Halloween party. They're running around with them outside in the garden. You know, they're getting used to wearing them. So you start off with the young ones and then the older ones will follow. 
<laughs> at least that's my motto. And the grandparents were really appreciative because uh, like when they went to the big stores to get their groceries, then they knew that the kids had something on. And if it's not really to protect them so much as to, to hopefully get them into the habit of being careful, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, we're lucky here in Newfoundland, I think. <laughs> mm. And a little bit of this, I, I don't know if you, um, you're, you know, you, you do a lot of the history stuff. Uh, my grandmother, who I was raised by, she actually used, she was one of those uh, Red Cross workers during the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, she was very young during the first one, but she knitted socks for servicemen and they sent them overseas to the Newfoundland Regiment. Yes. And I remember her telling me stories that all they did, the women were knitting and knitting and knitting. They knit gloves. They knit the, the New Flanders were really uh, the thumb and finger mitts and the socks. And they sent them in boxes overseas for those service people. And so I thought they were talking about the war on COVID. And it kind of made me think, you know, we're almost doing the same thing. So it's not mitts or socks, it's masks. And that made me feel good. And one of the reasons why I don't really want to take money for them, you know, I don't need the money at this point and people, not all people can afford them. Right. Mm -hmm. Not, not, not that you wouldn't, <laughs> it's just not everybody can. Right. Yeah. So it was just one way to give back. I'm, and, I'm curious. I'm curious about your, your grand, what was your grandmother's name? She, she was, uh, she was Mary Walsh, <laughs> not the Mary Walsh. There's so many Mary Walsh. My name's Mary Walsh, uh, but I go by Victoria, and I think all in the Catholic, everybody was called Mary something. Walsh, yeah. Yeah. So she was Mary Ann Walsh, and originally a Murphy from Bay Bulls. And uh, she was born huh, like 1897, 8 or 9 or 1900, very early in that time there. I know my grandfather was born in 1897, so she was only a few years younger than him. So. Um, she, she she worked at the Basilica for most of her uh, early years. Uh, I, I remember her saying she worked as a housekeeper at the Basilica. And we lived in St. John's in what's known as Georgetown on William Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then in when, when she got married to my grandfather, he was uh, a, a widower with three children. So she was a step grandmother. <laughs> Even more so. <laughs> you get into the Newfoundland genealogy here, right? <laughs> watch out. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so she was one of those women that taught me everything I needed to know until she passed away. And I was only 13 when she passed away. But uh, she always did a lot of embroidery, knitting, sewing. She made all our clothes, she made all our coats. And, uh, you know, my older sister didn't like that. <laughs> because we had to wear it identical. <laughs> and I was eight years younger, and I have pictures of Sheila and me, and Sheila's 16, and I'm eight, or I'm three, and she's 11, and she's wearing cutesy little dresses, and we're identical. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, and she didn't. So is <laughs> we that... Laugh, we laugh about it now, because the pictures are hilarious. She's there, like, with this really grumpy look on her face, and I'm there, no! I got a dress just like my big sister, right? But the but my grandmother was able to do that. She'd make all these fabulous clothes for us, and uh, we'd look real cute. <laughs> and so is that what got you? Too. Is that yes. what got you kind of uh, oh, yeah. interested in in textiles oh, I, and sewing? Oh, and, totally yeah. right. I mean, I think my sister hated it, and Sheila today can't sew a button on. But myself. I loved it. And I don't know if it's because she died when I was 13 and I yearned for more. I don't know. It, it, she wasn't around to teach me all of it. Uh, I remember learning embroidery, learning the basics of knitting. I learned to make chocolate brownies <laughs> and fudge. You know, I learned all of this baking stuff, but all of under 13. So, you know, there was not a whole lot of a higher level there. So uh, when I was about 14 or 15, I, I met another lady who was a fabulous knitter, Mrs. Uh, Gladys Baird. And she was absolutely um, really good at sort of 
passing on her knowledge of knitting to me. And she was actually the one that really started my going to the craft school. And I think in the, the Knit, Pearl and Listen uh, interview I did with Megan, I mentioned that, that uh, she knew Anna Templeton as a friend and she suggested, why don't you go to the craft school? You're really good at this. And I picked up knitting right away on a more complicated level, right away. I uh, hadn't really done anything from Knit and Pearl to knitting an Iran sweater that she taught me how to start. But everything complicated came really easily to me. And so that's why uh, sewing then, I'd make all my own dresses. I made my grad dress, you know, I was 16 and I made my own Vogue pattern grad dress. Mm. And uh, I loved it, right? And I couldn't get enough of it. So going to the Anna Templeton then was the sort of, in, you know, my other love was animals. And I just didn't think I could get into vet school. <laughs> I hated school. So, do you, do so you I wanted to be a veterinarian, but that was a dream, <laughs> a dream that I, uh, I said, no, I don't think I could do that one. No, I think uh, there's, there's a limit to what I was willing to go through. But um, the sewing just came so natural. Right. And, yeah. I, and it, it was uh, it was fun. Uh, my friends of mine who couldn't sew would come to me and say, could you make me this for this? And you know, I'd make them this. I made a, a suit when I was 17 for a. Uh, a friend of mine who wanted a men's suit. I actually tailored it. And um, that was from Mrs. Darby, uh, who was at the craft school. When I was at the craft school, I mean, it must've been 17 then. And uh, I was doing weaving and crafts at the craft school. And Mrs. Darby knew that I could sew already. So there was no sense of me doing basic sewing. So she said, if you come in after school every day, I'll, I'll spend a half an hour, before, you know, while I'm doing the students paperwork or whatever she said I will help you if you need to know anything so uh, I think from about October to Christmas I made a man's suit after school hours and Mrs. Darby helped me with all the finer things that I wasn't quite familiar with right because it, it was pretty hard to do but I was determined I was going to do this suit if I got all that beautiful fabric so who is uh, she who was who was she? Who was Mrs. Mrs. Darby? Darby? What was her? Mrs. Darby was the sewing instructor at so, the craft school. Yeah. She, Do you remember her first name? Taylor. Yeah. Oh. Teacher's first name. <laughs> Sometimes we never know those teacher's first names. Yeah. Oh, I know Katie Parnham and all of them would know it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't actually. It's, it's a, and it's probably, I don't know if it's just gone out of my head, but I never called her anything else other than Mrs. Darby. And uh, Hannah Walter, uh, I do remember Hannah Walter. She was an, um, the embroidery instructor. So she was uh, quite good friends with her. And uh, Dorothy Gale, but Dorothy Gale and Mrs. Walter were my teachers. And Mrs. Darby was the sewing instructor for all the people in the other program. So therefore I only saw her after school. And for some reason, uh, Nope. Do you, do you have, have a to memory? Look that one up. <laughs> yeah, I will. Do you have a memory of Anna Templeton herself? Just, I, I do. I, I only visually know her. Um, there was another teacher there, Lanning. Uh, she was Dutch. Uh, Mrs. Darby and Mrs. Walter were, were, were Germans. And like I say, there was so many different people. And Mrs. Gale was from Newfoundland. And we had Ms. Pitcher, the knitting instructor, who was a Newfoundlander. But um, Mrs. Templeton only kind of came to the school to, to visit, you know, to watch what was going on. I'm not quite sure what her role was. So, I mean, I was only 15, 16, 17 during those days. And like, I wasn't really interested in who was on the board or if there was <laughs> anything like that. It yeah. was part of the, cra uh, what, were, what were we part of? Uh, the trades and technology you know remember uh, the trade school mm. so it was just an offshoot of the trade school and it was part of the vocational education side of things so if you wanted to go into teaching you did the crafts and you got learned all the technical stuff or all the crafts that they taught in there which was everything under the sun and then in the summertime you would go to mun and you would do the summer vocational education courses 
And I don't know if you remember those, if you're no. still around. Extension services was still sort of around. Yeah, the extension was on and I did some, like because I was interested in all kinds of crafts, I did, uh, you know, natural dyes and spinning from Donna Clouston and I did photography from Manny Buckite. So I added a lot of other skills uh, or crafts or arts to what was, I was interested while I was doing the craft school because I just, you know, if I was going to do weaving, I wanted to know how to spin wool, how the process started rather than just weaving. So I wanted to know how to raise sheep. So I had sheep in the end and I could shear the sheep, uh, uh, wash the wool, um, spin, spin. Now I'm not a spinner. Like I didn't go into spinning like other people did. I just wanted a general knowledge of how everything could work. And as long as I could do it, then if somebody wanted to learn how to do it when I was traveling around, then I would know, have the skills to teach them and then they could go on. Right. So I wanted to do the vocational education. And I think by the time I got to the two years were finished and I would start the summer program, the vocational education side of it was canceled and you couldn't do it anymore. So that was too bad. So then I decided to go to art school and then I went to and applied for art school instead. And uh, I went to OCA <laughs> and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I went up there to do uh, weaving and textiles and ended up doing fine arts uh, and lithography and printmaking instead. And uh, it was mostly because the textile program was really difficult to get into, even though they accepted me for the textile program. I just, the, the way it is in all, when the classes are full, the classes are full, you know, they, they didn't take a whole lot. So I missed a couple of years where I was sort of, well, what do you want to do if you don't want to do textiles? You can't get into that. Oh, I'll try this. And I loved it. I mean, I liked the printmaking most, uh, the printmaking and the, uh, the lithography and the etching was was a more with your hands than mm. just painting right? yeah. so that's where i went instead and then i you know after that i came back home after years and went right back into textiles because textiles is something you can do from your own home and sometimes just different things ask of you uh, to take all of your skills and put them together and I think that's what I did in the 80s. I, I kind of came home and um, started making props for the parks. I went to work at Salmoner Nature Park and uh, mostly because they wanted costumes. So there I could make the costumes and I could work there and uh, work at the park as well. And that was fun. And uh, so then the textiles kind of started coming back into my life, right? And then it just became uh, more fun to do the, you could still use your art and your creative side of things, but you could use the textile part of the earlier training and combine the art to do whatever came up to make money. Because I had children by then and I had a mortgage and I, you know, I had to make a living. So um, I, I started a business uh, of, um, I think that's when I first met you. The children's storytelling. Yes, yeah. I think that also came from, you know, being an artist. I could uh, illustrate books in felt mm -hmm. for a project with the libraries, and then uh, it, that part of it was really nice, right? You could uh, incorporate the storytelling that I kind of learned from Salmoner Nature Park, being an interpreter in the park, making costumes for the the national parks and the provincial parks. And uh, learning to, uh, you know, talk to children because all those school programs, you have hundreds of kids coming through there. And so then I, I just started doing the children's storytelling. And that, again, was creating the little felt pieces for the, for the storytellers, right? And now I'm all, you know, story told out. <laughs> you're still <laughs> a good, all I can say. I'm still story a good told story, out. <laughs> you're still a good storyteller. <laughs> oh, great. I love it, but I tell you, uh, the, the traveling around the province to all those schools back in the, oh my God, 97 to 2008 and 9, that was 10 years. Yeah. There's a lot of traveling and uh, three or four weeks at a time on tour 
and luckily I had good friends, uh, Eric and Eric West, you know, I'm sure. Yes. Eric West and Heather Walter. And uh, we had a lot of fun traveling around the province when it was at the Heather and Eric. And then I'd go as the storyteller, you know, uh, rug hooker. <laughs> and so I combined the rug hooking and the storytelling in most of my uh, tours, right? So I had a lot of fun, right? Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of work. And then uh, uh, my kids were growing up. And the nice thing about that is you could go away for three weeks and then come home and you were home for four or five months working on your next tour. Um, and then so you can also making your props, right? Mm -hmm. For both the Heather and Eric show and, and sometimes for the parks in between, right? Well, we have fun. <laughs> we've covered a lot fun. of, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, yeah, I did. We yeah. <laughs> told you. <laughs> It's so 31 I, uh, minutes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> great. Well, I want to thank you for this. This has been great. No problem. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear what you're doing. And, 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 it, and I find the whole, you know, the history of your grandmother and, and kind of that, uh, you know, creating things for a cause that, that that's yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah, I was so tickled that I could follow somehow, like at the same age too, like she was 65. <laughs> when she passed away and I turned 65 you know around the same time of this happening so to me it, it just made I, I remember saying if, if anything it's in her memory that I'd like to have done something it's not like knitting socks for millions of servicemen over there boy I tell you but uh, you know it's a little something that we can pass on and I hope that I've actually I, I more hope that I've taught my kids that listen we can go out and help people even though we're all stuck in and you know, we were out gardening the other day for a lady who's 80 years old and wanted to dig up her garden. And as we delivered her masks, uh, my son said, hey, I can do that for you. And so he went over and he dug up her garden and, and she was pleased as punch. And I said, that's what I hope to inspire in the young generation, because, you know, we haven't been through anything like that in my lifetime. In all my 65 years, I've never been through something like this. Mm. And it really teaches us how to share and be kind and be nice to people. And I think we've all been there. I think that's the perfect note on which to end. That was excellent. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. It's someone's <laughs> phone, not mine. <laughs> anyway, nice talking anyway, to you, Nice Dale. talking to you. Thank you for yeah, this. Thank and you. hi to all your students. I'm sure they're a wonderful crowd. All right. Thank you very much. And take, take care. care. How do I end now? I, I, <laughs> I, I, will hit the, I will hit the end button and that will be it. So we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>